Welcome to Norse Code, the number one podcast for your Minnesota Vikings. I am your host and producer. My name is James Pagoshnik. Thank you so much for listening. And on the other end of the tin can and string, we have our analyst and co-host. He writes for the Daily Norseman, along with other blogs around the internet. And uh, he is Arif Hassan. Arif, how are you doing this fine evening? Uh, I'm doing well this fine evening. How are you? I am doing just fine, maybe even dandy. I'm going to throw fine and dandy in here. Still kind of uh, glowing from the beatdown we issued the New York Giants on Sunday. I have been waiting for years to watch a Vikings blowout on a Sunday night that didn't have us in the losing column. It has been yeah, I mean, it, it so was, long. It's just been... Yeah, and not only has it been just like a long time, it's just like it's been a while since anything I think satisfying has happened. Um, and I, maybe maybe the Giants aren't like going to win the NFC East or anything like that, but they're a high profile team. It happened on national television. The Giants were certainly in a spot where they could have uh, at the I think it was uh, you know before Thursday or something like that. Um, they could have been competing for the NFC East, and then the outcome of of the the Washington Philadelphia game made it irrelevant. But you know they were certainly in a spot where you know they're not they're not a terrible team, despite what it looked like in that game. So you know you take a below average team, you destroy them, and I think that that's exactly what a good team looks like. So that was there's a, there's a lot of validation there, and I think it's been a while since we've had that validation. I mean, we kept on going back to what was the week five, week four game against Denver as maybe sort of the best the team has looked. And then the Arizona game happened, which is great. And then this game happened. And I, I don't know, like we talked about two really good games that were losses. <laughs> now we get to talk about a really great game that was a win. It's so fun to do that. It's also fun to be a part of a game where, you could look away for a few minutes on Sunday night and be like, oh, there's still 14 minutes left in the fourth quarter. Like, it's it's one of those games where this thing has been over for a while. They're stretching for yeah. anything to bring up. Like, oh, it just happens to be the anniversary of the whole of the uh, of the Hail Mary. Let's put this oh, on Jesus. the screen yeah. and let's put the Vikings that fans was, down a few pegs. That was kind of nuts. But uh, yeah, I mean. It was crazy because uh, I remember uh, when the Vikings allowed that touchdown in the third quarter, I had checked off the box in the Vikings bingo that was allows garbage time touchdown. And, you know, everyone was like, yeah, I know for sure you should check off that box. And we all looked at the time and it was like, we're talking about the third quarter. Yeah. The game was over. The game, and it was, it, This is how crazy it was. Vikings fans who have watched this team blow 23 point leads, blow 16 point leads uh, in like to the Detroit Lions of all people. Losing a, a a twenty six was I think it was either a twenty six or a twenty three point game to the Packers who took it in overtime and won it. Well, you've seen this team, especially over the last three years. And I remember two years ago or maybe three years ago, this is a team that was notorious for getting a first half lead and then blowing it. So we've seen this team in particular blow leads, and we're a fandom that's like used to these blown leads. And it gotten to the point where Vikings fans were so comfortable that they called it in the third quarter. I just, I, I didn't think it was possible this early, sort of in the Mike Zimmer era. And I'm not saying that this is like, it, now we have the coach of the future. He's definitely going to win Super Bowl or anything like that. But it, it, I didn't think it was possible this early, you know, in, in a new coaching staff for us to become this comfortable in a lead, regardless of, you know, how much it was. I mean, the lead, by the time they scored the touchdown, the lead was only, you know, quote unquote, only, you know, 22 points, right? Um, I got and, into a, I got into a nice them. I got into a nice argument with the uh, with a girlfriend because she was talking about oh, well well it's, it's, she's she's a Packers fan and was, and was just miserable all day and then watching right. the Vikings do well <laughs> was just was just icing I on the cake. Why was she miserable? I whatever happened in that Packers game? I don't know. We switched off and she decided to watch Harry Potter for a little bit to try to make herself feel better <laughs> and I left the room because I can't stand Harry Potter. So, uh, I I didn't end up getting to watch all of the all of that ma- particular massacre, but the uh, the point of the story is that in the uh, middle of the third, 
I was still like really intently watching and she's like, or I said, made some comment about how, okay, well, I guess we'll be playing for the division and I went not so fast. Like this team right. has blown so many leads over so many years. I just want this to, I'm not believing it until all the zeros are on the board. Like let's just hold <laughs> off. And then in the, uh, in the middle of the fourth, I was like, Oh, okay, we're done. But, okay. I can, right. I can relax a little bit. Not even, since the era the Vikings aren't going to blow a, a 20, nine point lead in the fourth quarter yeah not since the era of uh of Favre and t-jack have i been co- this confident <laughs> in a lead and we used to when i went to the uh, i was at the dome a lot that season and just whenever t-jack would come out the place would just erupt like oh yep that's it okay everyone ex- exhale we're we're good for the rest of the game even t-jack can't mess this up <laughs> It's just it was just nice to see and Vikings Twitter was just all over it just enjoying it just like rolling around as much as we could it's just perfect uh before we get yeah, too much it's uh, the third weekend of the year where it's the in the same week you know the Vikings have won and the Packers lost I think that's the third time this year that both of those events occurred at the same time it is it is the third time. Before we get too uh, too into the uh, into the game, let's talk a little bit about uh, what we are. We are Norse Code. We are a podcast about the Minnesota Vikings. You can subscribe to us on iTunes, on Stitcher. We have an RSS feed. We have a website. All sorts of things that you can use to get in touch with us and to listen to our shows. You can also donate to the show. We do not have ads on the show, as you've noticed. Uh, We do not have ads. We are simply from the people, and we try to keep it as uh, high quality as possible, as far as sound quality goes, and don't uh, sit here and chill for 20 minutes about uh, mattresses or DraftKings or anything like that. So if you would like to donate to the show, you can do so at norsecodepodcast.com. There's a little button at the bottom of the page for donate, or you can go to our Patreon, which is patreon.com slash Norse code. You can become a sustaining member. It's a bit like NPR where it ends up just giving it a a per month thing. If you like the show, go ahead and throw us 350, tree fitty, just like the Loch Ness Monster. All we need is tree fitty. Just keeping the lights on, keeping the uh, the website costs down, and just trying to get this out to you as, uh, as often as we can. We're doing two shows a week. And uh, we'll be doing another show here in a day or so with a Green Bay preview, discussing a possible guest, but I don't want to get anyone too excited because every time we bring him on, we seem to lose. It has nothing to do with Aaron Rodgers, right? Like, it has everything to do with justice. Oh, I have 100% everything to do with justice. Yeah, screw that guy. So, uh, but anyway, we do two shows a week. If you find value in that, go ahead and uh, send us a dollar or two. We appreciate anything we can get. And... Uh, We can move to the actual news of the week, the news that just broke, in that Chip Kelly was just fired both as GM and coach of the uh, the Eagles. Part of me wishes he would have been kept on as GM and fired as coach just to see what sort of havoc he could wreak for next season. (laughs) <laughs> that would be amazing. Like, okay, so the job we originally hired you to do, uh, none of that. Just definitely the job that we reluctantly allowed you to have after you made a power play. <laughs> it turns uh, out you're too <laughs> interesting to fire. We want to see how much you want to throw at Mike Wallace in the offseason. <laughs> and Colin Kaepernick. Can we get another guy in here too? Oh, my God. Yeah, I would love to see Chip making moves. Uh, but without the ability to like understand where the pieces fit because he's not a coach anymore. Mm. It's just, you know, uh, I think that my coach, he probably would like this kind of guy. Let's just let's just get him. Let's just get this guy. Was it hey, two first round picks? Fine, let's just get him. <laughs> we don't need first round picks. We have veterans. We have crazy, <laughs> wily veterans. We have a guy <laughs> who won the rushing title last year, but somehow in our scheme can't seem to get over a thousand yards. <laughs> I got rid of this other guy who did perfectly, but he didn't run downhill enough. So screw him. I wanted an injured linebacker instead. It's a beautiful thing. Chip Kelly fired from the uh, fired from the Eagles. Just a weird set of circumstances. Like the off season for them was just so just just full of news. Like between them and Buffalo, everything was flowing out of that one area. Everything just wanted to go to either Buffalo or Philadelphia to sign when it came to the preseason and the, and week weeks one through four, I honestly didn't know their lineup. 
Like, it was one of those, <laughs> oh, they're still in the, wait, why would they get a contract? What the hell is Chip Kelly doing? Like, it was, I mean, it was stunning, especially like, so he, he made sure to keep Riley Cooper, got rid of Deshaun Jackson, and then decided not to spend money, let Jeremy Macklin walk. Like, it was just, and he convinced an entire fan base, and it, uh, I'll be honest, a little bit of us, like, sort of, you know, the, the rest of Twitter was, like, thinking about it a little bit, but he convinced an entire fan base that talent didn't matter. Like, that, that's, that is stunning. To me, that that he thought you could just out scheme the existence of talent in the NFL. So scheme and, uh, more important than talent, more important than food, more important than water. Talent is uh, is the lowest on on, uh, on all possible needs. It's it's I think it's like with the apex pyramid on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you need it the least. Scheme is is at the bottom. <laughs> scheme scheme is what you want. Scheme is what you can't have, but scheme is what you want. I get, I, you know, looking at the Chip Kelly thing just for just for another minute or two, it really seems strange that, or at least it, it justifies the idea that you can't have a full scheme work in the NFL. Like NFL offenses should not be based on scheme like this anyway, where you just plug players into. It seems like the idea that you can just plug them into a system it it's much it, it seems to work much better in a college environment than it does in a pro environment i feel like you yeah. learned that lesson yeah i think you know uh you to, to i shouldn't say to some degree nearly every offense in the nfl that's been successful has uh you know homogenized a little bit and that they take you know things that are successful from every other offense in the nfl and they add it obviously there are like twists and stuff like that you know there's terminology changes there's different priorities and focuses and stuff like that but you cannot uh bring what you have and that's all you bring like kyle shanahan uh in his first year with robert griffin in washington incorporated some aspects of the baylor playbook but did not incorporate the baylor playbook um, because I don't want to say they're gimmicks or anything like that, but they're, they're remarkably, I don't want to say one dimensional, a uh, unique or flavor or fasted in a way where, uh, you have the ability to win when you figure it out as a defense. And because you, you're in the same division, you've got a lot more people who are watching film, people are more experienced, uh, that when you figure out sort of the nature of it and the fact that it's relatively simple in college, then, uh, if you don't have an answer, if you don't have base plays that, that can just win with talent. And then it's going to be very difficult. And, you know, beyond that, you know, the, the athletes in the NFL tend to be very, very well-rounded and, and the players that you're going to get to play tend to have a wide variety of skills. And in college, you choose a particular type of athlete. So like Chip, obviously he had a profile at Oregon. They would tend to get track athletes uh, and that would work very well for the kind of scheme that they would implement. But in the NFL, you have these well-rounded athletes that can do everything and you cripple yourself by only focusing on one or two aspects of their athletic profile instead of all of them. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that's, that's the sort of thing that happens, but I think the bigger problem, you know, for chip first, I was kind of surprised that he got fired. Um, but the bigger problem for chip, apparently, according to all these articles I'm reading anyway, um, is not that he was losing. Although if he was winning, this, this wouldn't happen. Um, but it's that he made no friends uh, in, in, in the facility. So, um, you hear all of these reports coming out, like what happened, this, that. I think there's a really good piece in either like Philly Magazine or another um, Philadelphia like local beat thing. Um, and it was, you know, that, that Chip Kelly alienated people, that people thought he was going to come around to become friends. Um, and that he was like him and the guy that he installed as puppet GM, who also got fired, by the way, um, a- against the rest of the facility. And it just didn't work out. And so, you know, obviously Lurie did approach, or Jeff Lurie, I don't know how you pronounce it, Lurie, Lurie, um, Lurie, um, you know, had this conversation with Chip and said, if you, um, you know, withdraw your GM responsibilities, we can keep you. But if you don't do that, uh, we're going to fire you. And then Chip balked, and so they fired. Um, But it wasn't just that. It was like a culmination of a lot of things. So, um, you know, it's kind of weird. Um, I kind of felt like Chip, you know, I'm not going to say deserved another year, but should have gotten another year just because 
he's in a sort of unique situation where uh, he's got a relatively unique personnel acquisition strategy. He's got a relatively unique, you know, offensive setup and honestly defensive setup too, because the way that they design that defense is not something you tend to find around the NFL. And because of that, I think that, you know, if you give players a year, um, I mean, I shouldn't say a year, but because the acquisition strategy just occurred this year, um, if you give players maybe another year to get used to not just the system, but Chip Kelly and stuff like that, then maybe year four is when you get rid of this coach. Um, I know year three tends to be kind of the year in the NFL when you get rid of a coach, but I think year four makes a lot of sense, um, especially when you have a unique circumstance like Chip Kelly, who took over GM responsibilities partway through his tenure. That said, the defenses of Chip Kelly, I think, are pretty asinine, and we were talking about this before the show. Peter King's tweets today about the Chip Kelly firing are just moronic. I think that might be an understatement considering the uh, considering the topic and considering the source really like Right, right. They've they've been bad for a while, but this is this is borderline disgusting. <laughs> yeah. Um so this is well so first um so Peter King was like, no one saw this coming. Maybe people saw Lurie trying to change the structure, but firing before the end of the season, true. Like, it's fine, you know, you're Peter King and you say, I didn't see this coming. And, you know, my sources, you know, uh, it gave me the impression that that he was, you know, assured a safe spot or whatever. I'm floored, right? And, you know, whatever. That just means you've got bad sources. Which Chris, like, Chris Mortensen wouldn't know anything about that this week. <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, I mean, it means you got bad sources, which I mean, like Peter King, like, okay, fine. But, uh, um, to say no one saw this coming, that's just like, that just basically tells us that even though you are a journalist, you do not read the product of journalism, right? You don't read any affiliate media, even New York media got in on this, right? Like every, every podcast I've listened to over the past four months of the season has mentioned in some way how Chip Kelly is going to be, has to be fired by the end of the year or is more entertain or the league is more entertaining with him in it, but there's no way he lasts this year. Like, right. No, there were, there were people who were definitely more certain that he was going than people that he, the, that were definitely certain he was staying. So to say it was like an unforeseeable outcome, like that's just stunning to me. Yeah, the idea that uh, that he didn't know might have actually offended him. Like, right. the, the fact that he was not involved in the process of any of these, like, leaks, like, uh, it just, it was that efficient. Which says something about Philadelphia, because efficiency is something they pride themselves on. That they fired <laughs> him immediately before the end of the season, and then didn't tell the players. Uh, because the players were getting, like, finding out on Twitter and yeah, from calls yeah, from media. Yeah. yeah, players are like, what? Really? Damn. Like... Yeah, that's they wanted him out and wanted him out quickly. What can you uh, what can you say about last week? It's like it's like interesting. I think uh, it, so. What Peter King also tweeted out like the the records of like Hall of Fame coaches like in their first three years, and the fact that Chip Kelly did better than them. So he's like Chuck Noll, twelve and thirty, Bill Belichick, twenty and twenty eight, Chip Kelly, twenty six and twenty one, and it's like. I know you're not insinuating that Chip Kelly is better than Bill Belichick or Chuck Knoll, um, n- nor I think are you insinuating that Chip Kelly is as good as Chuck Knoll and Bill Belichick. But like, just because the, and Bill Belichick was fired, and I think justly so in Cleveland, like it made sense to fire him. Like now, now that we know who he turned out to be, like that maybe that's a different story. But like, no one has like future vision, right? No, so, no one is. Uh, uh, no one is Paul Harvey in the situation where they just know the rest of the story. Like it's it's not okay. Like it, right, it, and it turns out he's Superman, but back then he was just a lonely little wimp. Like okay, right, exactly, and like. Uh, you know, I think uh, someone else tweeted out that Pete Carroll had a worse record in his first three years. And it was like, yeah, Pete Carroll had a friggin' awful record in the NFL. And that's the reason he thinks he's successful. Now, if no one had fired Pete Carroll, he would still be stinking up the Patriots and or the Jets, depending on who the no one that fired him would have been. Right. And, you know, he would just be a bad coach. And the fact that he never got fired and he never, you know, took the time to like rethink everything when he was at USC and all that, like, that's like a big part of how these coaches like changed. Right. So to say, you know, Chip Kelly, he was 26 and 21. He's better than these coaches. Um, like, I, I think you kind of ignore like who these Super Bowl winning quote uh, coaches 
you know, are, how they, you know, changed and adapted where they came from. The fact that they did need to be fired because like most good coaches will turn a team around sooner rather than later. And so if you just wait for them to continue being awful, um, you know, then, then you're just, you're just, you know, turning the team away. And I think a good opposite example is actually Leslie Frazier, right? Um, Leslie Frazier, you know, they did not commit him to a big contract. They, in fact, actually didn't extend his contract at all after he made the playoffs in 2012. And most people are like, what? Why not? He made the playoffs. Like, you know, this team was so bad. You know, he did a, a great job as an interim coach when Brad Childress was fired. Uh, and then there was one down year, which you'd expect because he's a new coach. And then, you know, 2012, you know, with, with you know, finally, you've got a quarterback who, uh, had his full first full off season with the team, you know, they make the playoffs with, you know, the most successful rushing season in history and you don't extend him. You just, uh, you just option his contract uh, to the final year. And that turned out to be a remarkable decision. Right. And Leslie Frazier needed to go, right? Like we knew that. And, uh, but we knew that when he was fired, the fact that, um, you know, most people were surprised he didn't get an extension, I think showed the kind of, I don't want to say risk aversion, you know, or cautiousness, but showed the kind of understanding that um, you need to you need to be the kind of coach that can like replicate success. And you know, they didn't see the traits of the kind of coach they wanted, which is why they didn't extend him. So um, it's re- it's ridiculous to say like, well, these coaches did poorly. Why would you fire this coach who also did poorly? It's uh, one last thing to mention on the Chip Kelly thing before I swear we will go into the uh, the Giants, the, 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 the beatdown of the Giants. We're that confident in the beatdown of the Giants coverage. We don't even need to talk about it for the first 20 minutes of the show. It's, <laughs> it's great. One last thing on uh, on Chip Kelly. Uh, he does make the league more interesting um, with, with him and his crazy uh, product that he calls an offense. Do you feel like it is actually inevitable that he ends up in Tennessee, or do you feel like he sits out a year? Um, I I would really love it if he went to Tennessee because I think that he could do some fun things. I don't think that offensive line is really fit for what he wants, but I mean, um, you know, Bishop Sankey, David Cobb together, obviously Marcus Mariota, um, the kind of physical talents that they have at wide receiver. I don't think they're Either of them are very good, but Doriel Green Beckham, Justin Hunter, the physical talents anyway. It would be it would be fun. Um, but you know, whether or not it's like a good idea for him or whether or not he's gonna actually do it, you know, that's obviously like a different question. Um, but I mean, you know, w- what would happen if, you know, he went to the 49ers, right? I was gonna say, because there's no way they keep that garbage fire going. Like they have to toss uh, uh is it Tomalusa? Tom Sula. Tom Sula. Yeah, the uh, the used cars salesman. They have to they have to toss him out. Um, you might as well just put Chip Kelly in there. What's the worst that could happen? Yeah, right. <laughs> like, what's what's the absolute worst thing that Chip Kelly, as head coach and screw it, GM of the 49ers, <laughs> what's the worst that could happen? Yeah, that w- I mean that would be. That would also be fun, I guess. The word fun keeps coming to mind. Um, I mean, because there are obviously places he could go that would like not be as interesting to me personally. Like a lot of people talk about Miami, Tannehill. You know, people are talking about how he's always on the. He's kind of like the next Bradford or the next Stafford, where he's always like about to break out, and people are kind of like waiting for it to happen, and they kind of give him that kind of trust. Um, and maybe it never happens, kind of like Tannehill, or maybe he reaches a ceiling that is winnable, but like not consistently so, like Stafford. Um, but like, you know, you know, he kind of knows the offense because Bill Lazor was there, and it's just that that just doesn't seem as fun to me. I guess like, yeah, Jarvis Landry's a good receiver. Yeah, you've got you know maybe a couple of other weapons. J. J. I. who doesn't have any knees, and, but you know he's got a bad offensive line, and it's just not as fun as like Chip Kelly trying to figure out whether or not he should go Colin Kaepernick or roll with Blaine Gabbert. 
Let's, um, let's and, put let's put a petition together and see if we can get him on the 49ers starting Blaine Gabbert and the replacements because there's there's no one on that <laughs> team right like right. we lost to that admittedly but I feel like we can make fun of them now um, yeah, I, I think I think now that we've clinched we can put it behind us I feel like we can we can we can just be done with it we can we can make fun of them again I read a tweet from a uh, from a San Francisco fan who said I just want the Vikings to win the Super Bowl that way we can say that we beat the Super Bowl champs. <laughs> this uh this year i was like okay that that, that, that works I, yeah I that's fine that. uh so we destroyed the giants we made the giants our uh let's see let's let's go the pg mode our companions for this particular sunday evening and they didn't have a thing to say about it the giants were defeated and beaten quite handily in the cold uh, which is not something the Vikings have been able to successfully do a lot lately, is beat somebody in the cold. Um, the offense did not have to put up a whole lot of yards because the defense kept making the, making the fields nice and short for us. Let's, uh, let's talk about the offense, and let's talk about Teddy Bridgewater, who has now had three good games in a row, albeit he didn't throw for over 200 yards this game. Yeah, and you know I think some of that has to do with the fact that the Vikings pulled so far ahead not just in pure point margin, but like I think like conceptually by the middle of the third quarter that, uh, I mean, obviously, you know, you didn't need him to throw the ball because all they needed to do was protect a lead. Um, but I guess some of that actually comes from what I would consider a disappointing first quarter. The Vikings did almost all of their damage, um, yeah, at least offensively, but also points wise uh, in the second and third quarters. And, uh, and in particular, the second quarter, Teddy actually started out, I thought, pretty slow. And honestly, I thought kind of everybody started out slow. And they all kind of got into the groove of the game at different points throughout the game. Um, but on offense, I would say that Teddy started off the game pretty poorly. You know, I think that, you know, the the third and eight that was short of the sticks, I think he threw it to Thielen. Thielen was actually at the sticks. He was actually just a little bit beyond the sticks. And Teddy threw him short. Yeah, he had to um, run, uh, had to quick run back for that one. Yeah, and he had to run back, and that you know prevented the conversion. And I understand it kind of. Um, I, I think it was, I think it was a mistake by Teddy, uh, and by mistake I mean unintentional. I don't think he you know made the decision to to throw it short. I think it was just like his accuracy was off or whatever. Um, but you know, even if it wasn't, I can understand it because that's where Thielen was more open. He couldn't throw him outside because there was uh, you know the defense back would have got it, but. Um, you know, th- there's that. And then he also made a couple of wrong reads. One in particular, I think that he checked down to Adrian on second and five, uh, I think in his second drive uh, in the first quarter. And and Rudy was open, you know, in the seam. I mean, it was perfect. I mean, there was a safety up top, but safety was too far away and it, it could have been great. And, you know, those kind of like missed opportunities, you know, those are the kind of things that can sort of lose you a game. And if, if I didn't remember the game so distinctly being this insane beatdown, if I had watched this game without knowing things just from the all 22, I would have been kind of worried because, you know, some other things happened, right? You know, Fusco gave up pressure really early. You know, there was, there's a, there's a hit and there was a sack, I think from him. Harris played pretty poorly in the beginning. Clemens played pretty poorly in the beginning. And um, they all kind of, they all kind of gelled eventually. And they, it didn't happen at the same time. Fusco took some time to get it together a little bit longer than, than Harris did. And Clemens, you know, I'm not going to say, you know, he was great or anything, but it took him a little bit longer than the two of them to, to get it together. And Teddy kind of figured it out. And I'm not going to say those things are related because Teddy was doing poorly in clean pockets and he was making bad decisions. But uh, as he moved on, even in dirty pockets, he did really well. You know, his two throws to Rudolph were, I mean, they were just beautiful, right? I mean, Especially they were that, that gorgeous. gorgeous touchdown uh, throw where he just threaded the needle through uh, through the defenders. Like, he's getting more and more of those. Yeah, and he did uh, virtually everything correct on it too. He he did like he did veteran stuff on that kind of throw. I mean, he looked off the safety, forced the safety to 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 move with his eyes, uh, and then knowing that Rudy was open, you know, threw to threw to to Kyle Rudolph late. Um, you know, perfect ball placement, perfect accuracy. Uh, you know, he had the he had great arm strength on the throw. The safety was too out of the position because of his eyes. You know, his mechanics were, you know, not amazing or anything like that, but they were really good. Uh, his timing was perfect. I mean, it was, it was just it was just the kind of thing that you want to see from a quarterback, um, you know, not even at Teddy's caliber, above Teddy's caliber. And, you know, his second throw to, to Rudolph was just kind of if if this first throw to Rudolph was like, 
you know, Tom Brady in like 2006, 2007, uh, you know, Teddy's second throw was was like, you know, Ben Roethlisberger in 2005 to Rudolph. Like it was just like everything. There was chaos around him. Uh, you know, Teddy had to like scramble out of the pocket. Uh, this throw, I wouldn't say it was ill-advised because it was, you know, the right ball placement makes him wide open. Um, but this throw was like, it's a difficult throw. You have to really trust yourself and be gutsy. And he's running and he throws it right outside of Kyle Rudolph away from both defenders that are chasing him. And, uh, and it's perfect. I mean, it's, 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 it leads him into green space and he, and he gets a bunch of extra yards. And so, you know, there was, there was some really nice throws in there and, and he improved throughout the course of the game. So, you know, that was nice to see. And I thought, you know, Bridgewater kept on making good decisions, I think, after those first two drives were over. Uh, and uh, and it was, you know, it was a really pretty game. One thing that we should probably note is that Bridgewater hasn't thrown a pick since the Seahawks game. And he played against the Cardinals, who destroyed Aaron Rodgers. Uh, played against the Bears, who weren't necessarily slouches, but we, we beat the crap out of them anyway. And then the Giants did not have a chance to, uh, to throw a pick. Yeah, and it, and it's interesting because you know, um, you know, we've been talking about the Giants game, and you know, the the defense didn't scare us. I we we said you know beforehand, like, hey, I don't know what the script is. Like, what does it look like if the Giants win? What's the story? Um, and we were talking about the defense, and we were like, well, the cornerbacks aren't you know awful. In fact, some of them can be pretty good. Prince of is up and down. You know, Dom- Dominique Rogers Cromartie has had his moments. He's kind of average or whatever. And it turns out the best cornerback was actually the one we didn't talk about all that much, Trevin Wade, who had a great pass deflection on what I would call a really, really well placed ball from Teddy to Wallace in the end zone. Um, you know, Trevin Wade was the one who deflected it. And, you know, you, you take those three cornerbacks together, you take into account, you know, Landon Collins at safety, you know, they have some issues at the other safety position, but you, t- you take a look at that secondary, it's not a bad secondary. It's everybody else really who's bad. Uh, and so, you know, the fact that, you know, he didn't throw a pick against them or Arizona or Chicago, who, you know, their secondary is a lot better than, than people remember. I mean, they've got Kyle Fuller who's doing well. Their safeties are doing a lot better. I think, you know, I think it's Adrian Amos who's, who's doing really well for them. Uh, and, you know, you, you put all those together, the fact that he doesn't throw a pick in those games, I mean, that's, I mean, that's nice. I mean, he's not doing Russell Wilson five touchdowns, no picks, right? But he's doing all right. Yeah, something, uh, nothing, uh, nothing we should be complaining about right now. Uh, and also, he's over three thousand yards. It's the first time since Brett Favre started for us that we have a quarterback who's thrown for three thousand yards. <laughs> That's kind of like a god awful statistic, too. Though. I don't care. We we have somebody <laughs> over three thousand yards. We've had ponder for too long. Yeah, I mean, it's nice that you've got a quarterback who is consistent enough to stay on the field uh, and doesn't throw for like eighty yards in a game like Ponder. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's the kind of, like, it's a signal that we don't have to keep switching out quarterbacks, right? Because you go from, you know, Donovan McNabb to Ponder, and then you have Ponder's like weird 2012 season where he throws for less yards per attempt than Adrian rushes. And then, you know, you go from Ponder to Castle to Freeman. Um, so Freeman was never a Vikings quarterback. All those tweets are a lie, (laughs) but yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's great. Um, it's, it's like a statistic that sort of underscores how pathetic the Vikings quarterback situation had been. Um, but at the same time, you can also kind of like celebrate the fact that Teddy seems to be the guy. I'm reminded of that awful, I think it was a Monday night football thing where they showed the last like 10 or 15 years of Vikings quarterbacks against, I think it was the Packers where it's just been two. But, like, <laughs> there's that god-awful montage where it was, like, every quarterback, Gus Farratt, Brett Favre, Donovan McNabb, Christian Pond, like, everybody. Joe Webb. like <laughs> <laughs> Joe Webb. Oh, my God. He's returning kicks in Carolina. How weird is that, like, from a— It's super weird because, uh, you know, you're watching the games more and more because Carolina is, like, good. And you just hear Joe Webb's name every so often. You're like, what? Wait. I were Joe Webb. Exactly. <laughs> it's like oh, Joe Webb was trying to kick, and I'm just sitting there, just going, "I wonder what. Uh, I wonder if he had a nice conversation with Jared Allen the moment Jared Allen got there. Like, oh hey, remember me? We, I uh, I won in uh, I won in Philly on a Thursday. It was great, or like a Tuesday. <laughs> it was a Tuesday game. I was great Tuesday that game. night. So he's uh, so Teddy's definitely uh, he's managing. 
that's that's what he's doing. He's managing the game and doing it well. Um, he's not going to hit 4,000 yards unless he has the world's most spectacular game against the Packers. But the uh, other story we could talk about is the run game. Because Adrian Peterson went for 104. Jarek McKinnon went for 89, including a spectacular run in the fourth quarter for a touchdown, which I almost thought was cruel. Because that defense was broken down. It was tired. And I'm sitting there, and I even said it aloud right before the touchdowns, like, this is just cruel. Like, you're going to put the fastest guy on the field against that. He's going to break through. Two plays later, he just burns them for, what, 71 yards? He has the second fastest run of the week, according to the advanced stats for uh, uh, for the NFL. Like, just ridiculous. 21 miles an hour. Yeah, no, I mean, and, you know, I think some of it's just, like, get it together, Giants. <laughs> but... Uh... Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, McKinnon, you know, got two touchdowns in this game. You know, one of them, you know, admittedly came pretty late when the when the score stopped mattering. But um, yeah, no, I thought um, overall the running game. And again, this is kind of a situation where uh, where it took a little bit because, you know, I think Adrian, you know, uh, you know, was stuffed for well, not stuffed, but, he, you know, got held to two and then he had to improvise five and, you know, which is nice. But the, the running game overall seemed to be you know, whatever, an average until sort of late in the game. And, you know, I think that, you know, a lot of credit to Adrian, I think, for being able to improvise in a way that I didn't really see in the first couple of weeks of the season. Um, He wasn't as consistent as maybe, you know, we would have liked or we had seen sort of uh, in the middle of the season, but he definitely did, you know, a lot of really, really good stuff. Um, And then, uh, and then I, I, you also kind of want to credit the interior line because, you know, as much as, you know, I, I pointed out Fusco and Harris, then we should also talk about Berger, you know, overall, over the course of the game, you know, over the four quarters, and not just the first quarter where Fusco and Harris struggled, the four quarters, I think on balance, that all three of the interior linemen had a really good game, especially as run blockers. So uh, there was a lot of additional consistency that they provided by being able to open up holes at the middle that Adrian was able to take advantage of. You know, I thought Adrian, he looked, zippy you know he looked he had a lot of acceleration he looked really fast in a way that in some of these games this year he didn't quite look like it uh and uh you know there's a lot of that he had he had a lot of patience Jarek mckinnon's runs uh had uh, a f- you know, phenomenal amount of patience and he was a very smart runner uh and uh and, it, and it's too bad right that uh that they took away sort of the jet sweep touchdown um, but you know, overall, I thought the Vikings run game, it kind of improved over time. And a lot of people think that run games improve over the course of the game, but that's not really true all the time, especially because some teams use the same concepts over and over. Uh, and, but in this case, I think it's definitively true that the offensive linemen and the running backs both improved, you know, significantly as the game went on, it was really nice to see. The other thing that we should point out is that Adrian Peterson is in the lead for the rushing title. He is up 64 yards on uh, uh, on uh, what's on Martin on Doug Martin out of uh, out of Tampa Bay, and I was just going through some of the stats for rushing leaders for the past uh, couple of years, and other than 2012 where Adrian got 2,097 yards, uh, this is a kind of a weak season for uh, for rushers. You know, the lead rusher right now has 1,400. The average for the last couple of years is somewhere in the you know seventeen or eighteen hundred. So it it seems a little right. like it, it's like Lashawn McCoy, Jamal Charles, uh, Demarco Murray all got eighteen hundred, seventeen hundred, sixteen hundred. Yeah, Peterson got two thousand, and this year, uh, you know, the rushing leader uh, Peterson. Uh, and yeah, you know, some of that has to do with uh, suspensions and injuries like Le'Veon Bell. Um, you know, Devonta Freeman. Uh, Charles you know, had. Right. You know, Charles got injured. Devonta Freeman took over late, um, you know, after Tevin Coleman got injured. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's it's just been a, a really weird year. Todd Gurley uh, started late, basically. You know, Jonathan Stewart's been injured in a couple of games. Um, you know, Darren McFadden uh, didn't take the majority of the carries at Dallas in some of these games. Um, LaShawn McCoy was injured. Right? Rawls uh, might be leading this if he hadn't uh, found himself on IR. Yeah, I you know Rawls would definitely be sort of in the conversation. He has the most, I think, yards per attempt out of everybody in the conversation. So uh, he would have been he would have been a really good 
addition. He only started seven of the games, and he'd been in 13 of the games, but in some of those games, he didn't really take too many carries. So, you know, if Marshawn Lynch had been, you know, out all year, or if Rawls had just been able to take, you know, instead of having 150 or so carries, if he had 250 or so carries, you know, maybe his yards per attempt would drop, but he'd probably be leading the league. So, yeah, no, this is definitely a year where I would say it's weak uh, in terms of total rushing yards. Um, but, you know, beyond that, it's also just a year where I think it's been weak for runners, not just, you know, total rushing yards, but like, you know, Todd Gurley saw his explosion of yards and then it died. Duck Martin's been incredibly inconsistent. Um, you know, Darren McFadden is Darren McFadden. Um, you know, Cam, Jonathan Stewart's Cam Newton, just, Cam Newton is currently ranked 29th overall in rushing. That is phenomenal, uh, but also kind of scary. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like and, and Russell Wilson's 37. But like, that's that, that's a hell of a uh, that's a hell of a number of uh, of rushing yards he's got this uh, this season. Yeah, uh, I mean that's part of the reason he's in the conversation for the MVP, right? Yep. Uh, so, what do we think about the offensive line's protection this particular game? You know, he was rushed. Uh, he got hit seven times. He got three sacks on uh, on Teddy. Where do we stand on Matt the turnstile Khalil on this uh, on this game? Because he had two plays in a row where it was clearly his fault that everything went to hell. Uh, yeah, um, it, it's weird because, you know, for offensive linemen, you want to say, hey, uh, let's take a look at sort of the totality uh, of your plays and see if, uh, see if you know, you did well overall. Uh, this was probably Khalil's worst or second worst game of the season, depends on how you want to evaluate penalties. Um, you know, he gave up a sack, he gave us some pretty bad pressures. Um, and, uh, and they happened in quick succession. They happened, I don't want to say all relatively early, but I think one thing that's also missed in this game is, you know, he, he also had that penalty. Um, but also he was actually just not a very good run blocker either. Um, and you know, that's like, that's something you want to take into account too, when you evaluate, and this is probably, you know, one of the worst games that Matt Khalil's put together all year. And that's really frustrating because the past four or five games have been kind of disappointing for him. Um, after we'd been talking up his season all year, you know, to see it kind of maybe diminish a little bit as a result of, of whatever, whatever, maybe he has an injury. It, it happened again. Maybe he lost motivation. Maybe he's lost technique or whatever. Or maybe he's whatever been listening is, to the show and is thinking, Oh, I'll show them. I'll suck. Like I've never sucked before. <laughs> I'm sure Matt Khalil is a friend of the show for sure. Um, no. Yeah. And you know, it, it, that's kind of annoying. He was probably the only offensive lineman I would say was definitively bad. Like even TJ Clemmings had some, some pretty good moments in the run game. Um, Watching and, Adrian Peterson pick up rushers and hold them. Uh, not oh like my in, gosh, was, that was stunning. I was just sitting there like, Oh, here comes the rush. Here comes Peter. Holy crap. Adrian Peterson's actually holding them back. Like, when did he become this good of a run blocker, like a pass blocker recently? Yeah, it was weird. I remember I tweeted out something along the lines of like, wow, so on that play where the pocket kind of collapsed and Teddy just had to give up on the ball, I think it was an incompletion of Wallace. Uh, Adrian Peterson was like the best pass blocker on the field. Like he was just kind of nuts that he, you know, picked up his guy, uh, you know, stonewalled him, didn't, didn't allow a pressure. I was, you know, it was interesting seeing Peterson do that. What was nice is that a combination of Peterson, you know, and pass protection um, and, uh, and and an interesting offensive design from North Turner allowed uh, the Vikings to put both McKinnon and Peterson on the field at the same time uh, on a couple of snaps. And that was just, that was great to see because it allowed, a, it allowed the Vikings to, you know, put together like interesting things like, you know, like yeah, they had like jet motions and stuff like that. Uh, they had the the touchdown that was nearly called back. I believe both of them were on the field for that. But it widens the defense because McKinnon is a threat everywhere on the field. Um, but also you could just motion him in and take him, you know, have him run up the middle with Adrian Peterson as your lead blocker, right? Um, and so, you know, it was nice to see that kind of offensive innovation um, because, A, it means that Norv's not done, right? It means that he's still uh, continuing to innovate. And, and along with the adaptation that he's made in terms of shortening the drop and making the pass game easier for the offensive line and for Teddy, um, is that, you know, he's, he's still moving in different directions that are maybe a little bit hard to predict, uh, which includes, of course, you know, putting McKinnon and Peterson on the field at the same time and finding a way to make that useful, despite the fact that only one of them can get the ball. 
Um, so yeah, no, Peterson in pass protection actually helps advance that because if he can be halfway decent in pass protection, it really opens up opportunities for McKinnon, who has been, you know, like we've been talking about, pretty good over the last three games. If we still did the number of the week, even Dusty couldn't screw this number of the week up. 3,991, which is the number of snaps that Matt Khalil played in a row. He missed his first Before snap. missing the snap, yeah. He missed his first snap uh, because of what appeared to be an ankle thing. They x-rayed it. It looks fine. He's going to be uh, he's gonna be on the field for, uh, for Sunday night. But that, uh, you know, we, we've said a lot of things about Khalil. A lot of things. But consistently, he has not been hurt. He, uh, this offseason, had surgery on both of his knees just to, like, clean up, uh, just to clean up a little bit. But otherwise, it's been, he's been really consistent uh, showing up. He might have been an open door some games, but. Right, no, and and it's, it's fantastic that, that he has, you know, the talent of availability because that's something that's, you know, sorely lacking uh, for the Vikings offensive line in general, but like among offensive linemen, because it's such a physically demanding job. I'm wondering if maybe because he played through some injuries that maybe that was to the detriment of the team, but you have to think about like who would step up in his case. And uh, you know, in, in this game, it was Austin Shepard, but in like previous games, like in 2013 or, you know, in 2012 um, or yeah, maybe it was, it was 2013 or 2014, I should say. Um, you know, when Matt Khalil was playing, you know, maybe subpar, you know, if some of that is because of injury, like maybe it would have been better if someone stepped up, wait, that someone would have been Jamarcus Webb, maybe not. Um, so it was probably a net good thing that, that he chose to hide his injury in terms of on-field play. Um, maybe it contributed to a slower recovery time for him, which makes it a net bad thing. Um, but certainly you kind of have to respect it. If nothing else, you just have to respect uh, his ability to play through getting hurt, his ability to stay on the field, his ability to avoid injury. All of those things are things that are good qualities. And, uh, you know, in light of the fact that he missed like seven snaps, um, you know, the first of any of the snaps that he missed in his career with the Vikings, uh, we should probably, you know, point out like, hey, you know, this is something that he's been doing better than literally all of the other offensive linemen. Yeah. So good on you. Uh, that's a hell of a streak. And it's certainly something to be respected. Let's talk about the uh, let's talk about the defense against Eli Manning, who showed up. Uh, the question was he gonna, was he going to show up and be like uh, just a tank over everybody and just be be amazing? Was he going to be a Sherman tank, or was he going to show up and be an absolute septic tank? And the man <laughs> was a septic tank. Oh my god! Um, so much so that uh, I believe Eric in his uh, in his stock. Uh, in his uh, stock uh, up and down uh blue chips was it uh his, his article yeah the he ended up listing <laughs> he ended up listing eli as an asset to the vikings <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh he was a he may have been a blue chip stock i think too yeah. uh, and we were we was... were talking before the show about how bad eli is against the vikings because he, he just has this heroic just just this, this, this just horrible history against us and it's not just the Vikings that he's bad against. Yeah, his history, uh, you know, is is so volatile that he'll have some unique, uh, you know, single team records uh, that'll show up. And, and it turns out that it's not even the the Vikings aren't even the worst, right? Um, so I looked it up. So every team that he's played against. Um, we looked at the bottom five. And so the Vikings, uh, in terms of passer rating, are actually the third uh, worst opponent for Eli Manning to face. So, you know, he has a 54.8 career passer rating against the Vikings. That's, you know, obviously that's stunningly bad, right? That's a 5 to 14, uh, you know, touchdown to interception ratio, which, you know, that means that's that's 14 interceptions, right? Like that's that's incredibly bad. Uh, and that includes obviously the Monday night game, uh, with a quarterback who shall not be named, uh, helping the Vikings out in whatever way that he felt possible. You know, Eli also played that game, you know, pretty horribly, which you know uh, accounts for some of that. But you know, that includes you know a fifty-four point eight completion rate. But you know, none of that um, overpowered Eli Manning's terrible, terrible record 
against both the Baltimore Ravens and the Chicago Bears. Against the Ravens, he had a 51.0 passer rating. And against the Bears, he had a 54.6 pass rating, just 0.2 decimal points below the Vikings. So um, he's had some pretty bad games against some teams in a row. And he's the kind of inconsistency that, that he sports, um, you know, leads to this weird distribution where he has really bad games against some teams. And the Vikings, one of those teams, he's three, five in those games. So the, uh, the first thing we should talk about is Harrison Smith and his, uh, and his pick six, because what a beautiful play that was. Yeah, every part of the play. I mean, I think, you know, Harrison Smith, it's unsurprising, of course, that he's the kind of player that does a good job watching film, given how good of a player he is. And welcome back, but, Harrison Smith. Right, he is in style. Um, you know, what happened on that play, when you watch it on the All-22, I think arguably it's actually more impressive than watching them on the broadcast because, you know, Harrison keyed in on what Eli was doing before it even seemed like Eli knew what he was doing. Uh, Harrison knew what route combination he would attack. Uh, in this specific set of circumstances based on what Eli was doing, and he attacked it, right? And, uh, you know, I think someone said that there was actually a window that Eli could have thrown it to um, where it would have been a completion, but I actually, I don't know. I don't think that that's necessarily true based off of what I saw because the way uh, that that Smith closed on the ball, if Eli had thrown the ball faster, um, you know, I think that maybe Smith doesn't get the interception, but I also don't think that the receiver gets it. So, um you know, Smith closed in on the ball from he was literally at like the midway point of the field, uh, you know, laterally. And then, you know, he also had to move downhill to get it. Uh, so he moved in a, in an enormous distance from the point where he makes the decision to the point where the ball is in his hands. And then the next part of the play is that he houses it, right? Like he completes the play um, and uh, and, you know, big players, you know, they make big plays in big games. And this is exactly what happened there. Um, and, you know, it, it's it underscores maybe some of the issues that we've had with like the postseason nomination process, but uh, for sure it's an example of, you know, the kind of spark that the Vikings were missing, you know, with him gone, because, you know, even if you take away, you know, that interception and his ability to generate turnovers in general, um, you know, he had, he had a very good game. It's not just the pick six, you know, he was able to, uh, he was able to, you know, force Eli to to throw, you know, shorter than he normally would have. Which I mean, it's Eli Manning of all people, right? Uh, you know, he he intimidated receivers. Um, you know, at the catch point, there was even a point where I think a receiver had alligator arms uh, because they heard Harrison Smith's footsteps. So I mean, he was he was he was stunning, um, you know, overall in the game. But he was just also he was just nice to have because he helps the defense in ways that are very difficult to identify. Another interception went to Captain Munnerlin, who very nearly took it to the house. Like it was so close, so, so close. It so ended close. up being, I believe, an Adrian Peterson two-yard touchdown yep. or something like that. My only thought when, uh, he got the, uh, when he got to the four was, oh, well, that's too bad. I kind of wanted Adrian Peterson to get like 20 yards on this play so he could get a little more, uh, a little more of a lead against Doug Martin. But okay, well, we'll, we'll get a two-yard touchdown. That's fine. Yeah, yeah no worries. Um, so the, actually the reason I was kind of a little secretly happy that, uh, Captain Munderland didn't house it is because I just, I want Teddy to throw for passing touchdowns just so that we can like shut up about his passing touchdowns. Honestly, and we wouldn't right because, you know, Blake Bortles threw like 35 or 40 or whatever. Um, but like, you know, if the biggest statistic, statistical criticism of Teddy is the number of touchdowns he throws, um, then artificially creating situations where he throws touchdowns seems like the answer. Uh, and, and that would certainly be one of those situations. And I would love for that to be the case. Obviously it wasn't, which obviously doesn't change, you know, how well Teddy played the game, but it does change maybe sort of the postseason analysis of Teddy, uh, from people who, who start at, you know, numbers like touchdown interception ratio. So I had my own selfish reason for wanting that, that near pick six to not be a pick six, but, Unfortunately, unlike for people who had Adrian Peterson on their fantasy teams, um, you know, my my wish was not fulfilled, but but the Adrian Peterson wishes were. On the plus side, that very important QB wins column gets to be uh, gets to be added for. Uh, yeah, he gets he gets another one, so he gets the he gets the critical and very uh, you know evaluatively sound QB win. Exactly, that's all that anyone really wants anyway, and. Uh, so Harrison got one, Captain got one, uh, Everson almost picked off Eli too. Everson Griffin was real close there. 
Yeah, Everson Griffin, uh, you know, you could say that he dropped a pick or whatever or went through his arms, but, um, you know, that kind of happens. I mean, I've seen Jared Allen when he drops off into into zone coverage. He doesn't always grab those picks either, but you put him in enough of those situations and, you know, someone with as much natural athletic potential and ability as as Everson Griffin, you know, even if, you know, that doesn't necessarily include hands, you know, it's, it's, you're going to get some splash plays. And I think that that was a beautiful play design for Mike Zimmer because it combined a lot of the concepts uh, that we've seen, you know, from Mike Zimmer in the past, which include, you know, a double A gap blitz, which is, you know, often called a sugar because you're sugaring the A gap. And, you know, uh, the zone principles for the linemen that include the linemen dropping off. Um, and so it dropping off into coverage, usually that's Brian Robinson because Brian Robinson's, you know, very athletic and, you know, he has the ability to turn his hips and move. Uh, and he's kind of used to dropping off into coverage, whereas Everson isn't. Um, but, you know, as, as, ever, as that happens more and more with Everson, you know, you can you can create situations where it's really difficult for the quarterback to evaluate what they're doing. So you combine the fact that you've got, you know, two blitzers in the A gap. Uh, I think one of them blitzed. And then I think the defensive tackle, in this case, I think it was uh, Shree Floyd, uh, you know, takes Everson's spot while Everson drops back. It, it, it is functionally a four person rush. Um, but it combines, you know, the confusion that it causes for the center with the double A gap look and the confusion that it causes when you drop a defensive lineman into, into zone coverage and creates these perfect pick opportunities. So it was awesome. It's, you know, unfortunate that they didn't, you know, turn into a pick. Um, but it shows, you know, continued innovation on the defensive side, because I think that Mike Zimmer uh, is really taking advantage of the tendencies that he's creating and then breaking. Sandejo also got a pick, and I almost forgot about him. But we we really nailed hard uh, nailed on him hard this in the beginning of the year. But he's turned out to have a good couple of games here, hasn't he? Uh, he's had a good couple of games. I think that this game, uh, if you unlike Harrison, if you took this pick away, I think that he would end up on the negative side of the ledger. Obviously, you should give him credit for the pick, you know, uh, and also Xavier Rhodes too, who deflected it. Um, and it takes you know it, it takes a certain amount of skill to to you know, react to deflection right away and, and, and grab the pick. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't say that he made up for it because I think the pick is more valuable than, than the late, um, you know, than the late catch that he gave up by not wrapping up on the tackle. But, you know, there's a lot of things that he had to clean up. I thought, uh, you know, in this game, you know, when, when he doesn't wrap up, you know, there are occasions where he is out of place and stuff like that. You know, he still has a long way to go before he can prove that he's going to be the guy that sits next to Harrison in 2016 you know, at the safety spot. But I think that that sort of pick, you know, whether or not he's the one that caused it, um, you know, is certainly, you know, good evidence in his favor. Um, but, you yeah, know, he had a, definitely an up and down game. And I think that if you took a, if you took that pick away, uh, you'd be a little bit disappointed with what he produced. One of those Adrian Peterson situations where he has 37 yards until he breaks out in 81. Like, oh, OK, yeah, well, well, Peterson exactly. had a great game. Like, did you see the 80 yard run? Like it was great. It was, it was crap before that. It was, you know, one to two yard runs for three quarters, but he got his big one. He's fine. Sunday. Yeah. got his pick. He's good. Pretty good comparison. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so moving on from the interceptions, the lack of Beckham was definitely a problem for, uh, for the giants. Like they, they folded quickly. They were able to get a couple of, uh, catches to people, but it looked like two catches per person pretty much. And, Man, just the lack of Odell Beckham, the lack of that great deep threat, the throw it up and just see what happens, just just seemed like it, it destroyed the uh, the Giants. Yeah, and you know it, none of the receivers seemed to be able to generate the kind of separation they needed. Not Ruben Randall, not Dwayne Harris. Um, I don't even remember if Hakeem Nicks got on the field for that many snaps, but um, yeah, the, lacking Odell Beckham certainly hurt them. And whenever you say this, you always want to be like, but I mean, the Vikings played well regardless, right? Um, but it was definitely a big part of the game uh, that, you know, Beckham wasn't even in it, you know. Um, it certainly made Xavier's uh, world a little bit easier to deal with on Sunday night. Right, because, you know, normally he'd be following, you know, a supremely talented receiver like Beckham. Uh, but instead, he was able to defend the side of the field, which man- means that, you know, not only would he definitionally be facing someone who was just weaker than Beckham, but... Uh, you know, the footwork for him is a lot simpler and, you know, he has less to think about and stuff like that. So there's a, there's a confluence of factors that, you know, Odell Beckham not being there helped the Vikings out a lot. Um, but yeah, no, they, they definitely missed him because I mean, 
I mean, they, I mean, I'm looking up the target stats right now. So Hakeem Nix was targeted three times, one catch for four yards. Ruben Randall targeted five times, two catches, you know, one for 80 yards, and that's the Andrews and Deho uh, issue that we had. And then Miles White, four targets, I believe. Uh, three or two of them with Ryan Nassib on the field, um, but two receptions for 34 yards. Will tie three receptions for four yards for 28 yards. Uh, three, three receptions and four targets for 28 yards. Um, it was just like, you, you look at that, you see Ruben Randall got the majority of the targets um, along with Shane Vereen. Um, yeah, it's it, yeah, lacking Odell Beckham was a big part of the reason that the game was a beat down. Now, I think that they probably still would have won the game, you know, if Odell Beckham wasn't in it. But, um, and I say probably just because I think that, you know, maybe you don't get those interceptions if Odell Beckham's in it, and that changes the tenor of the game completely. But, um, yeah, I think that, you know, it had a significant impact on the outcome of the game. But, you know, the Vikings were probably good enough that if Odell Beckham had been in the game, uh, that it would have been a much closer game, but they still would have won. The one thing that I was left uh, kind of amazed at was the holes that their offensive line is able to create for Jennings. Like, the Giants' offensive line really showed up as far as uh, uh, as far as helping their run game out. You know, Jennings only got 74 yards, but each time he was out, he was getting more than five. Like, Jennings seemed to be getting much more in the way of, uh, uh, of holes than, uh, than you would have expected, considering how well the defense played. Yeah, no, for sure. When you when you when you see you know a box score like that, and you see that you know maybe garbage time took up a significant portion of of their scoring, like fourteen of of what was it like seventeen points that they ended up scoring were were in garbage time. You want to say, oh, the defense must have played phenomenally, and of course the defense did play phenomenally. They played really really well. But uh, you're right that you know uh, the offensive line, particularly the interior offensive line. I think Eric Flowers actually had a pretty poor game. Uh, but the interior of the offensive line did a pretty decent job for the Giants in terms of opening up holes. And, you know, I was, I was taking a look at this on the All-22, and it's interesting because, you know, Anthony Barr, for example, uh, he had, he was kind of up and down, and he didn't take too many snaps because the Vikings were resting him, you know, in Nicholas, Greenway, and Kendricks. Um, but he had, you know, there were a couple of situations where I saw him get off of blocks a little bit late and he couldn't make the tackle. For the most part, I thought he had a good game, but, you know, that's the kind of thing that shows up. Chad Greenway looked pretty good until he had to play in nickel. Uh, when Anthony Barr was off the field and he had to, you know, assume a, a greater role. And I thought Chad Greenway uh, had a lot more problems until then. I thought that, you know, early on in the game, he was coming off of blocks pretty well. Um, he, was, he was chasing all right. Um, he was getting to the hole quickly enough. And then he just kind of dropped off and he was, you know, people were able to lock him up, at, you know, when they were blocking him and stuff like that. Eric Hendricks was really up and down. You know, he uh, he took some licks early, I think. Um and then improved pretty phenomenally both in the both in the run game and in pass coverage. Uh, and you know, I thought overall he had a he had a very good game. But I think that early on, you know, when you watched him, it was kind of disappointing to see him. You know, he wouldn't get leverage right on some of these blocks and stuff like that. And so that's kind of why a lot of these offensive line holes opened up. You know, I think everybody basically knows that Linval Joseph wasn't playing well at the beginning of the game. He played pretty dominantly throughout the rest of the game, but at the beginning of the game, he was having some issues. So. You know, that's like a confluence of factors, I think, that, um, you know, contributed to why, you know, the interior offensive line for the Giants were able to create some of these big holes. Because when you have inconsistency, even if even if like three of these four players ended up playing net good or, or net well or whatever, um, if you have inconsistency, there are just going to be times when these holes open up. And if you're an offense and you have the ability to attack the weakest part of a defense – an inconsistent defense means one that, despite having a lot of talent, is going to just have some holes sometimes. So yeah, for sure. One last thing about the uh, about the game, I noticed that the Vikings seemed to know when Eli was going to snap the ball. Like there were a couple of times where it was more than just luck that uh, we were able to get off the box and just hit the uh, and just hit the line as hard as we could and it seemed like every single one of these plays ended up resulting in a loss for uh for the giants did you notice anything in the way that they were able to read the snap count or just figure out exactly when this was uh this was going to be snapped because there were a lot of instances where it seemed like they just knew what eli was going to be doing yeah um you know i don't know if they have like a tell or whatever um, or what the snap count is, but it certainly looked like, especially Kendricks and Smith were able to respond to the Giants uh, as they were snapping the ball. I thought, you know, uh, Daniel Hunter and Everson Griffin did a good job getting off the ball really, really quickly. 
Uh, and, you know, some of it just had to be that, you know, Eli or the offensive line or somebody has a tell or uh, that, you know, based off of the film, we know kind of what what the snap counts tend to be uh, when they're on away games or something like that or, or, or you know, whatever. Um, so, uh, yeah, no, it, it certainly looked like either, you know, there's, you know, a bunch of really instinctive players, which is not that hard to believe, or, you know, there is some situation where, you know, film analysis produced, um, I don't want to say a silver bullet or, but like a pretty big marginal advantage for the Vikings to, to exploit. Watching Barr and Kendricks specifically on the line, you could just tell because they would show the snap. And uh, at one point they're like, oh, it looked like he might've jumped. No, he didn't jump on that one, but it was just so close like remarkably close like fractions of a ha- like fractions of a quarter of a second close to when that thing was going to go like man that they, they had to know something or had to figure something out anyway i had noticed that throughout the game and it was fun to watch especially because it was benefiting us and uh it was involving lots and lots of stress for eli on the flip side of that it was kind of strange to watch teddy get them on the hard count get them to jump and then hand off the ball like and maybe this is just an awareness thing or a veteran thing but it was it it seemed strange that we were able to get them to jump the flag was already thrown and then he just completes the run anyway yeah no um i think that happened either tw- two or three times in the uh, in the game yeah i don't know uh i don't know what the issue is i don't know if joe berger has a tell um or or if teddy has a tell but i think that they actually did it um, and maybe it's because I'm a fan that I'm, I'm interpreting it more optimistically, but I think they may have done it a little bit on purpose because of how advantageous it was to have the hard count ready. Because if you make your snap counts obvious, uh, then when you try to draw them off sides, it becomes a lot easier. Um, and you know, the Vikings did that twice in the game, unfortunately, and they weren't for like free shots. They were both run plays with Peterson, but um, you know, it seems like it was definitely more intentional of the Vikings to be, a little bit more, uh, you know, the signal a little bit more what their snap count is that they can take advantage of the of the um, of the opponent's tendencies to jump. I liked it. We should have more of it. Damn it! It was a good uh, <laughs> it was a good thing to see. Let's uh, let's go to the mailbag. Got a couple of great questions in here. Racer K asks, how big of a blow would it be to lose George Patton from the front office in the off season? It'd be huge. You know, he's been rumored to uh, to to be named in a bunch of different, um, you know, GM positions around the league. I think, uh, you know, most recently it was with the Atlanta Falcons. But, you know, he's been rumored and he's I believe he's even interviewed, um, you know, with, uh, with with a couple of teams. I think that, you know, I think, for example, the Jets interviewed him and he said no. Um, you know, I think that, you know, the and, Browns. And just to be uh, clear, this is our assistant GM. Uh, yeah, so uh, George Patton is, uh, you know, the assistant general manager. He's actually a very important part of the Vikings, and not just because he holds that title, but because we know that he holds, you know, a very important, uh, he plays a very important role in the way that the Vikings scout because he sets sort of the training regimen for the scouts. You know, he identifies um, the kind of traits that they want in players, obviously, along with the coaches and Spielman. And he's actually been a big part of the way the Vikings do their value calculations. Uh, for the draft, so when they make draft day trades, you know, obviously Spielman makes the final decision, but the kind of the, a lot of the math that goes into it, um, you know, is a result of you know what what George Patton has done, and it's crazy because he's actually turned down a lot of interviews or turned down a lot of potential jobs uh, for you know being the general manager, and that includes you know turning down a full uh, g- a general managership position. A job with the Jets. He's interviewed, you know, with the Bears and the Rams. You know, he's being connected to the Falcons right now, which is why this question comes up. Uh, and um, you know, he's, uh, you know, he's often. Um, I don't want to say a liaison, but he's often the connection that that Spielman has to some of the lower level scouts, uh, and and uh, you know, coordinates a lot of the information that they have together. Um, he's also made some pretty important decisions on some of the players. You know, I don't have all of the information in front of me right now, but I do know. Uh, that Patton has been a big part of of some of the critical decisions for the players that have ended up on the roster. And so I think, if I'm remembering correctly, he was a big part of the Shreve Floyd decision. You know, in retrospect, you know, obviously it seems like it's it's an obvious decision. It's a player that a lot of people expect to be on number three or number five, drops all the way to number 26 or 24 or whatever, uh, and, and you pull the trigger. But, I mean, there's often a reason that a player drops, and if you don't know what that reason is, you're definitely taking a risk. Some teams panic a little bit too much, but um, if 
if other teams have information that you don't have and they're acting on it, you know, sometimes it's better, even if you don't have that information, to also act on that, you know, I guess pretend information that you don't have. And so, you know, either you know what the reason is and you and you have to determine whether or not you have you you made your evaluation appropriately and weighted uh, everything in that evaluation, or you don't know what the reason is, and you have to take a risk on everything that you know about the player versus that you know the kind of things that you don't know. Uh, and so, um, if I'm remembering, he was actually a big part of you know just telling the Vikings to go ahead and and take this guy, you know, who they had I think like three overall. Um, and so, you know, that was a great decision, obviously, and he's been a big part of um, you know the kinds of decisions that the Vikings have made to, to build, you know, the successful young team. Um, so it's not just that he scouted players and it's not just that he's in the organization in a high role. He has helped design the systems that have allowed the Vikings to be pretty good, uh, including, uh, you know, the, the draft day, you know, trade evaluation. So he's, he's big and it would be big to lose him. The real Sandbun asks, why does our defense have such a hard time against the run? If our D line is so good. Um, some of it actually has to do with the linebackers. You know, a lot of people think that Eric Hendricks is playing pretty well this year, and there are moments where he's playing, you know, pretty outstanding. But even in, I think he won Defensive Player of the Week for two weeks this year. And in one of those weeks, you know, I don't think that he necessarily deserved the award because I don't think he played all that well. You know, some of it, you know, Chad Greenway is on the field, right? Some of it, um, you know, Linval Joseph is not on the field. And when he is on the field, you know, um, you have to figure out, you know, whether or not, you know, he is playing well. I and mean, I think that, you know, for the most part, he is playing well, but, you know, he, he, there are a couple of snaps where he's not playing well and that kind of shows up on, on you know, those big runs. Um, Anthony Barr, you know, he's a phenomenal linebacker, but there are times where he's just going to make mistakes. Shree Floyd has been pretty up and down this year. Tom Johnson, you know, he started off the year pretty poorly. So there are just times, right, where, uh, where even though the defensive line is very good, uh, you know, the, these collapses and run defense are going to happen. I think Everson Griffin overall is a very, very good run defender. I thought he had two really bad games uh, in run defense this year. Uh, other than that, I think that, um, uh, you know, Brian Robinson has been very up and down in terms of run defense. And, you know, some, sometimes that happens too. But I think that the majority of the problem uh, actually has to do with the linebackers. Um, because as, as much as I think the linebacker play is trending up this year, uh, I think that, um, you know, Chad Greenway has been a problem. Eric Hendricks has been very up and down that Anthony Barr has had some misses. And uh, we have two questions from Charismatic on Twitter who asks, is uh, Daniil Hunter an Alden Smith clone? With Barr-like talent and size, can he transition into an outside linebacker slash defensive end hybrid? It's a good question. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think that... Uh... I understand where it's coming from because Alden Smith is extremely athletic. He's long. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't necessarily like disagree with somebody who made this comparison, but it's maybe not the best comparison or one that I would go to, um, you know, coming out of, of Mizzou, Alden Smith was not a very good run defender because Mizzou does not ask their, uh, you know, ask their defensive ends um, to, you know, contain the run uh, at all. Actually, it's, it's one of the, things of the system is that they just ask their defensive ends to rush, rush, rush. Um, he wasn't, you know, very bulky and, uh, and he didn't anchor very well. Uh, and his burst was surprisingly meh for a player that's known to be as athletic and as long as him. I uh, mean, that, you know, that's when that, and that's when he was coming out, but I think that he was, uh, he had better hands. He was much more gifted as a, as, as a, as a player who is a technician, um, you know, he, uh, you know, he was disruptive against the run when, when the plays were running right to him. But for the most part, you know, he got by on great athleticism, but also, you know, fluidity and, uh, and, and hand technique that I think is kind of under, that was kind of underrated for him coming out, uh, as well as just violent hands in general. Daniel Hunter was asked to stop the run first and then rush the pass, which is why a lot of his sack totals were down, uh, at LSU. And as a result, he actually became a very, very smart defender. And I wouldn't say that Ellen Smith was either smart or dumb as a defender. Obviously, he's kind of dumb in terms of his personal life. Um, but smart or dumb um, as a defender when it came to the run because he wasn't, just as, wasn't asked to, but he didn't develop that kind of awareness that, that Daniel Hunter did. Daniel Hunter was really, really smart in terms of being able to read the play coming out of LSU, but he's super raw technically. Very athletic, probably more athletic. Actually, I 
actually more athletic. I shouldn't say probably definitively more athletic than Eldon Smith, super raw. And, um, you know, he just needed a lot of work before he could, you know, rush the passer, but he was, he was very intelligent in terms of knowing where he needed to be. And he had great instincts. So I would maybe compare him more to like an Ezekiel Ansa, super raw, really smart, uh, and and bulky enough to do whatever he could probably be kind of like an outside linebacker in a lot of schemes but i think that he actually is just best fit as this 4-3 defensive end so to answer your question you know not a bad comp but i think that i think that the you know the the ezekiel onsa comp is better that's that's like that's quite the hot take you have on eldon smith's personal life i don't know if people are going to (laughs) be able to get past that and listen to the rest of the episode how dare you talk about Alden Smith and calling him and calling him a moron in his personal life? Yeah, I've impugned the good name of Norse Code. You have. I, I didn't know it was good. I, well, I know it wasn't good, but that's that's just sad. Uh, next question from Charismatic is, when Sully and Lodeholt come back, does it make sense to switch Harris and Fusco sides? Uh, yes, but I mean, it's like... What if Harris is also only good on the right side? Um, it's, you know, I, I don't want to say you're playing with fire because now you you know for sure that Fusco is probably bad on the left again. You know, maybe there's an injury concern. Uh, maybe he's, you know, uh, tight when he's moving to his right. Maybe he's a little bit looser when he's moving to his left or whatever, or vice versa. Um, but... Um, Yes, but you know, you expect maybe a potentially similar drop off for Mike Harris. But the thing is, we don't know if Mike Harris drops off if he moves to the left. We do know that Fusco probably drops off when he stays on the right. So you're trading um, a certain improvement for an uncertain, um, you know, lack of improvement or decline. Um, so, which I think is a trade you want to make, but like is also like. Maybe you have the same problems. Who knows? So, like, it wouldn't necessarily fix anything. It's something I would consider. Um, if, if Fuss goes injured, then no, because, like, I mean, if you have a spot figured out, just like don't screw with it. Um, Does this but, turn into yeah. one of those known knowns and unknown unknown situations? I, yes, but I was gonna try to avoid saying it because we've used that a couple of times <laughs> in the podcast. Just wanted like, to make it, sure the phrase kept popping up in my head, and I was like, "No, bad, go away." But that's what it is. Better the devil you kn- know. Let's okay. Tommy Gunn asks, is the Teddy we saw on Sunday the Teddy of the future? I.e., spreading the ball, low overall numbers, highly efficient, etc. Well, it, it's difficult because the Teddy of the future is not going to have Adrian to take the load, uh, which means that he's probably going to be asked to do a lot more, both in terms of uh, total attempts and also in terms of creating like sort of an explosive you know, outcome from the offense. But I think that, you know, spreading the ball is something that he's going to continue to do. I think that he's going to be, you know, continue to be very efficient. I don't know if he's going to continue producing low overall total numbers. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that... Um, you know, he's in line for like Philip Rivers type pass attempts or Drew Brees's, you know, yardage totals, you know, unless the Vikings just want to overwork that arm. And it's just obviously that's not the kind of thing that Mike Zimmer, uh, you know, wants to do. So in a sense, yeah. Next question is from Iowa Josh. We all, we started talking about this a little earlier, I think. Do our O-line have tells? It seems like some teams read our O-line a lot better than others. I would uh, I'd put the Packers in uh, right at the front of the line for this one. Yes, uh, yeah, I think the Packers do. Um, I don't know if the O line has tells. It's also difficult to figure that out because the O linemen uh, this year are different than the O linemen last year, different than the O linemen the year before. So you know maybe maybe it's just Berger who has a tell. In which case, you know uh, having Sully back will fix that problem. Maybe not. You know, maybe it's, uh, you know, maybe it's Phil Lodeholt uh, or maybe, you know, it's TJ Clemmings who has a tell, which, yeah, that would not be very surprising at all. In fact, I, he probably does have a tell because he, I think that he sets back a little bit further on passes uh, and he's just more likely to put his weight on his heels on pass plays. Um, but that's, that's not something I've, you know, evaluated fully. So, you know, maybe, maybe I'm just like, you know, producing something out of thin air or remembering something I saw once or twice. Uh, but, you know, you know, if, if that's the case, then, you know, Phil Lodeholt coming back will resolve that problem. So who knows if the offensive linemen, 
you know, have it tell or whether or not, you know, it's just the fact that you've got some backups in there and they're less likely to, to hide their intentions. Um, I don't know. Um, I think that, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, how sometimes it's, uh, it's beneficial to not disguise your snap count. Maybe that's a part of it too. So um, that's just, you know, too difficult a question for me to really answer. I will say that in that department, maybe Clemens is a concern. Speaking of uh, stepping back on uh, uh, before snaps, AP is really far back uh, when he's taking some of these snaps. It looked like he was about 10 yards back for uh, for some of these. Just building up power, or is he... is Because uh, these were also run plays. Uh, building up power or something else? Yeah. Um, it's pre- The maximum he's back is probably 8 yards from the line of scrimmage, but it certainly looks like he's really far back. I didn't know... I didn't note... Uh, in this game, you know, how far back he was. So maybe it was 10 yards, but the further back a running back is, the more, uh, you know, the defense is alerted to a run. And that's like something that they put, you know, in college defensive playbooks, you know, take a look at how far back the running back is. And I think Matt Bowens even wrote about it a couple of times, um, you know, either for the Bleacher Report or for the National Football Post. Um, You know, when he was a safety, it was a strong tell if the running back was seven or eight yards back uh, that it was a run play, along with obviously, you know, a lot of other things like the personnel in the formation and stuff like that. So that's, you know, that's something that signals to defense that the offense might run it. And the reason, of course, like you identified is, you know, the ability of the running back to gain steam and gain power. That's probably, you know, the majority of it. But I think that, you know, another thing that you can add to it potentially is uh, is that the running back has a better time seeing, you know, holes and lanes develop. Um, so, you know, that's another thing that you can kind of add to that equation that a lot that artificially gives the running back some patience. Um, without ha- without them having to literally be patient. Next question is uh, an interesting one. It's from Matt Nelson, who asks, where do we start the petition for Spielman to sign Eric Weddle? Harrison deserves talent next to him. I, uh, I pulled up Weddle's contract. Uh, Weddle starts, or used to start, he's on IR for the rest of the year, uh, for the Chargers. He's a nine-year vet, He's 30, and he is, uh, his last pay was 7500000 dollars So, I don't know. He had a $10 million cap hit this, uh, this, last, this last year. What do we think about potentially bringing him in as, a, uh, as somebody next to, next to Harrison Smith? It is, like, definitively not a Spielman-style move. But, you know, hey, if you know, you're one player away, you're one player away. Um, and, you know, safeties are really difficult for the Vikings to find, it seems like. Um, I would not expect it to happen. I'd be surprised if it happened, but I would be okay, you know, with a two or three year contract for Eric Weddle. Again, like you said, he's 30. Um, he's lost a lot of, of what, what has made him so good. I mean, he was at one point the most athletic safety in the league. And this is a league that includes Earl Thomas and Eric Berry and, you know, Devin McCourty, you know, and he was, you know, he was an astounding athlete and he was a really well-rounded athlete for a safety too. Um, and so, you know, he would fit the Vikings schematically, um, both as a strong safety and as a free safety. Um, and um, you know, he could do a lot probably for the Vikings, but it just doesn't seem likely. He's old, he's going to be expensive, uh, and the Vikings just really like to go young when it comes to filling in sort of new talent. Obviously, Terrence Newman is kind of an exception, but they did draft a cornerback first overall, so it's not as if um, you know they, they didn't attempt to go young first. Um, so, you know, I think that uh, or prioritize going young. I think that it would be nice. It obviously depends on what his what his salary is going to be, but I, I guess I just don't see it coming. I I agree with that kind of move. Uh, I just I don't think it's going to happen. It would be interesting. He could fit, but the idea that he would be here kind of flies against everything that Spielman does. So most likely not. Right, and you know maybe these things change when if if Spielman is sensing that the team has turned a corner, and now you can start you know, investing short-term instead of only investing long-term. But the only information we have is what he's done, so probably not. Final question is from Vikings Haffy, who asks, which potato chip best describes Chip Kelly? So James and I were talking about this question before the show. We're both very proud of our answers. We did not reveal what our answers are. I'm going to go first because I really like my answer. It's the ketchup potato chip from Canada. Um, an acquired taste. Ooh. Yeah, it's an acquired taste. Uh, it's very difficult to find, uh, you know, around around the NFL or around the United States. 
Um, and it's kind of the dominant chip market or the dominant market for head coaches, the NFL, the United States. Um, but some people will just swear by them. The, I mean, some people will say it's the best friggin' tasting potato chip ever, and they'll defend it to the death. Uh, and, uh, and you can find it everywhere in Canada slash college football. And, um, and you know, it's, it's, I don't want to say ubiquitous, but it's definitely, it, maybe you want to say it should stay in Canada. And again, I like chip a lot, but maybe that's the best, <laughs> the best way to describe it. Maybe chip should stay in Canada. I like that. Um, I'm going to go with, uh, with something a little different. Um, Lays puts out these year end, uh, new flavors right every uh, every year and some of them are really good and some of them are very interesting and would be very uh, uh would very be, would be very good on the market some of them smell and taste like feet and i feel like chip kelly is one of the ones that smells and tastes like feet like the oh, a rex ryan chip yeah basically it's it's a rex ryan chip it's basically the same area um Wow, working in a foot fetish uh, Rex Ryan joke. I didn't see that one coming this episode, but but bravo. Um, I do my best. <laughs> we, we try at Norse Code to offend as many coaches as possible. Um, but he, he definitely reminds me of the, uh, of the I think it was the Parmesan garlic, or it was like the Parmesan garlic chip or like breadstick chip or whatever, where it was like, oh, okay, this, this, this could be interesting. People have been talking a lot about it. And then I, I take a couple of bites like, wow, this, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I need to, to go through a little more of the bag <laughs> before I make my snap judgment on how weird this is. And uh, nope, still crap, still crap. Well, maybe, maybe I need to pick it up a different time. So I pick it up a different time and it's still just awful. Just abysmal. Like, okay, well, this is clearly not for me. I have no real desire. I mean, <laughs> if some people like it, good for them. Perhaps it should not be in my grocery aisle. This seems like conceptually such a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> like, why can't we have chips that taste like uh, that taste like garlic cheese bread? Oh, because they taste like feet. That's that's why. <laughs> All right, so that's the verdict on uh, on on Norse coat Chip Kelly tastes like feet and should stay in Canada. <laughs> that's that's your hot take of the uh, uh, of the whole Chip Kelly firing thing, direct from Norse Code. That is uh, that's going to be it for the show. Anything to plug? Uh, nope, I have no idea what my next article is going to be, but um, we had to look for it, I guess. I was joking uh, on Twitter that we should just hire somebody to do, to transcribe, like an intern, to uh, to transcribe episodes. That way, we can just have that for you so you can just plug the uh, plug the analysis from the shows into a uh, into a bi or bi-weekly column oh hey that would um suck for an intern but that would be great that's free, <laughs> that's, free content that, that's that, what well, it depends on whether or not we're paying the intern but well we, we you never we'll pay an intern free. you should never pay an intern like gawker yeah, not gawker, if you want to make like, money yeah gawker protests aside you should never pay an intern and <laughs> aside from like the basic ethics of business practices just, just don't no pay an we've intern. we have discussed business at business ethics quite a bit on norse code believe it or not we are not going to dive into that one one more time but why, one of why our most we... downloaded episodes is titled corporate morality you know who knows maybe <laughs> this is a secret niche that yeah i don't uh i don't know Although I do, I do uh, like the fact that we have ninety thousand downloads for the year. That is, that's pretty cool. Uh, just wanted to point that out to uh, to listeners. Thank you guys so much for listening to the show. Uh, looks like we're gonna hit uh, over ninety thousand for the year. Really appreciate it. Really appreciate the support and uh, and donations. You can donate to the show at norsecodepodcast.com slash. Uh, not even a slash. It's just donate the button at the bar bottom of the page. You can also go to Norse Code's Patreon at patreon.com slash Norse Code and become a sustaining member. Tree Fitty works just fine if you'd like to uh, to, if you'd like to donate to the show to uh, help out. If you find value in the show, please throw us a buck or two. Totally your call. We appreciate it all the same. But uh, I think that's going to be it. We have the Green Bay preview coming up. We'll be releasing that on Thursday. 
We have all sorts of things to cover there, and uh, we will discuss internally whether or not we should bring on a guest or if we should bring him on for 20 minutes and just yell at him. I feel like we could just publicly shame him, and that would be totally fine. I don't think anyone would have any problem with that. Least of all him, actually. <laughs> I might have to be a part of that one just just for that just for that twenty minutes of just yelling at justice. I'd be the worst possible thing would happen. It'd be like his computer would somehow become like sentient and like try to avoid the call after a while. Like, oh, they're they're making fun of my master. I must stop the call. I must cause all of these technical problems and ruin the show. The rise of the machines happening through his computer, <laughs> which he will be getting on loan from Dusty because Dusty's laptop is the original villain in this whole like right movie. The fugitive, exactly. But that is going to be it for the show for Reef for Dusty. Uh, my name is James. You can follow Arif at Arif Hassan NFL. You can follow Dusty O'Connell at Dusty O'Connell, and myself. I am at Big Mono. I also do the Norse Code DN uh, Twitter account. So for all of us, to you, happy holidays. Look to the uh, look for the Green Bay episode. And our formula is this: keep Teddy alive. And we'll see you on Thursday. Norse Code is the official podcast of the Daily Norseman SB Nation blog and is produced with cooperation from Pompous Jerk Productions. Pompous Jerk Productions. Attitude with attitude. The opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of their contributors and do not reflect official positions of the Minnesota Vikings, SB Nation, the Daily Norseman staff, or PJP. No information in this podcast should be construed as gambling advice. Please obey all local gaming laws. Our formula is this. We go out, we hit people in the mouth. 